There are, in fact, <clears throat> many very important questions that come out to us and confront us in all different phases of our lives. There are some <clears throat> today who are asking the question, where will I go to college? There are some parents asking, when will you apply for college? There are some questions like, what am I going to do to make a living for myself? While the parents are saying, when are you going to get on your own? There's that really important question. Will you marry me? All kinds of important questions we could talk about. And they are, in fact, important. But there is no question more important than this one. If I die tonight, where will I be in eternity? There are a lot of things that we need to talk about with respect to being like God wants us to be. There are all kinds of topics and all kinds of issues that confront us. It is those topics and it's those issues that have created the condition that we have religiously in the world today with thousands of various church groups teaching radically different things that identify what makes a person a child of God. But I think there is only one thing that should be given primary focus. And that primary focus addresses the question. Because the question is about my eternal destiny. It is about understanding what the Bible teaches to know at this moment that my relationship with God is one that will allow me the opportunity to be in heaven. All other discussions seem to me to be peripheral to that one. I know that godly people care about the souls of the people they know. I know that. I know that you care about people that you know who are not Christians. I know that you care about people who teach and practice things that you don't think ring true with Scripture. I also know that if any one of these walks up to you and says, Will you have a study with me? Will you sit down with me and let us go through the Bible together? I know that you would do one of two things, every one of you. You would either sit down yourself and have that study, or you would find somebody who would, and you would go through it as well. I know that. So here is the disconnect. The disconnect is between I care about those who are lost but they're not asking me to study with them because it's difficult to know what to say or how to say it to stir that desire to study. Here is the special emphasis for the morning. If you want to bridge that disconnect gap, 
I'm going to give you a way to do it today. When you leave on the right side of the lobby, in that communication area on the shelf, you will have access to a tract that has this lesson in it. And I'm going to ask that each of you take one. Now we're going to run out and I'm going to print some more. But I'm going to give you the opportunity. All you have to do is take that tract, maybe as a family, and you give it to one person and you say, we're all reading this. Why don't you? And what it will do, potentially, is open up that discussion. It very well may be the gap closer. So what are we going to talk about? What is the point? For just a few minutes, here's the point. Everyone we come in contact with, at the moment we contact them, is either in Christ or out of Christ. That's just a fact. And we all know that we need to be in Christ. So the only thing that's really important in that immediate discussion is to help them get to the point of understanding. Am I in Christ or am I not? I want to make this case. Lay it open for you. Not that it's brand new case to most of you. Maybe a little different twist, maybe a, a deeper understanding, but I want to make the case so that you have the background and the understanding when you take this tract with you. Here's the case I'm going to make. I'm going to make the case in the next few minutes that the point of baptism, immersion in water, is the point that a person leaves the relationship outside of Christ to the relationship inside of Christ. It doesn't happen when a person believes. It doesn't happen when a person repents. It doesn't happen when a person confesses. It happens when a person is immersed. That's the point I'm going to make. That is the point of the, of the track. And it is written in such a way as to focus this individual on asking that one question. Right now, where do I stand? And if I die, if I die tonight, where will I be? Here is why I believe that to be true. Number one, the Bible presents the case that baptism is the beginning of or the end, that is, of condemnation and the beginning of salvation. The text that was read to begin Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 makes that case. Listen also to the words of Jesus in Mark 16 and verse 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Why? Because that belief did not go on to baptism. Baptism is the end of condemnation, the beginning of salvation. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. When once the long suffering or the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which eight souls were saved through water. There is an antitype that also now saves us. Baptism. 
Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Peter was referring to the time when in Genesis chapter 6, God looked down from heaven and he said, All flesh has become corrupted before me, for they have corrupted their lives in my presence. It was then he instructed Noah to build that ark. And eight people got on board. Eight were saved. The rest were lost. What saved Noah? Noah. According to 1 Peter 3, it was the water. Sure, he was in the boat, but the water raised the boat while drowning everyone not in it. The text says, there is an antitype that now saves us. We don't use that word antitype much. But here's the structure. The Old Testament was the type. The New Testament is the antitype. It means against the type. Here's the type. Here's what you put against the type. The Old Testament was the shadow. The New Testament brings out the reality. When you stand in front of a wall on a bright day and you see your shadow, it has a bit of a look of you. But that shadow is not you. It's a type of you. You, in fact, are the antitype to that shadow. Peter said, baptism is the antitype to the type of the water that saved Noah in those old days. For he said, baptism now saves us. A person cannot, therefore, according to that passage, be saved, then be baptized. Because baptism is the point at which condemnation ends and salvation begins. Number two, baptism is the point at which guiltiness ends and godliness begins. Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. We are buried with him by baptism into water, into his death. Buried with him that the old man of sin might be done away. Yeah? How's it done away? Because God gets rid of the guilt. God gets rid of the guilt. He sends it away. It's gone. Romans chapter 6, beginning verse 4. Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death. But just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, certainly also we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old former life's passed away. Why? Because I was guilty. But through obedience to God in baptism, the guilt was removed. And now listen to the words of Paul to his, meant to his young protege in 1 Timothy 4 and 7. This man who had been baptized was told, Exercise yourself in godliness. Once a person rids his or her life of guilt, it is now time to turn and be godly. I was guilty, now I'm godly. And when did that happen? Did it happen when you were sorry because you were a sinner? No. It happened when you, in water baptism, accepted what God's plan was, and he removed the guilt. So now I can live godly. Third, baptism is the end of sinfulness 
and the beginning of sinlessness. In Acts chapter 2, Peter was preaching that great sermon. He looked out at those people who just 50 days before had participated in killing the Son of God. He looked at them and he said, You, by wicked hands, have taken him and killed him. You. He didn't hold back. You're a sinful. In verse 36, they looked at him and said, text read, and being cut to the heart, they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were sinful people and they knew it. We sinned. That was wrong. It was terrible. I got to get rid of that sin. Anyone who finds out real sin in life wants to rid it, don't you? You may struggle and fight because you're having a hard time getting rid of it, but it certainly isn't because you don't want to get rid of it. Because that's what sin does. It makes us conscious of what's really there. Listen to what Peter said. To these people who said, what shall we do? Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. These people were sinful. And Peter said, repent. Had they stopped at repentance, they would still be sinful. But because they were baptized, they were sinless. Because baptism removes the sin. That's why the Spirit could come to live within them. Because the sin is gone. Therefore, the Spirit could come. Baptism is the point at which sin is removed and sinlessness as a life begins. It's not previous to that point of baptism. It's not after that point that sin is taken away. It is in that act. But baptism is also the end of disobedience and the beginning of discipleship. The last words Jesus says to his disciples were these. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. You want to be a disciple of Jesus? Here's what he says. Two participial phrases, baptizing them, teaching them. Discipleship begins with the obedience of a person in doing what Jesus said to do. Be baptized. Baptizing. But discipleship starts there. It doesn't end there. Because then that baptizing is followed by teaching. Teaching what? All things. All these other things come after this thing. The teaching that at the point of baptism, a person goes from being lost to being saved. I've been accused of teaching that baptism is some kind of magic solution that is more important than anything else that we are required to do. Well, that's just not what I believe. Baptism is not more important than hearing the Word of God. 
It was Jesus who said in John 12 and 48, the words that I teach you, these words will judge you. It must be pretty important to hear the words, right? Baptism is not more important than believing in Jesus. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. John 8 and 23. Must be pretty important to believe. Baptism is not more important than repentance. Jesus said, repent or perish. Luke 13, 3. Repentance is pretty important. Baptism is not more important than confessing the name of Jesus. It was Jesus himself who said, you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. Confession is pretty important. Baptism is not more important than these. It's just the last one of these. When I have this discussion in personal study, I ask some form of this question. What was the most important step you took from your car to my office for this study? Usually they say, oh, the first one. Interesting. What if you didn't take the second one? Would you be in the study? Oh. Then it's the last one. Well, then how could you take the last one if you never took the first one? Oh. There is no more important step from the car to the study. They're all equally important. But I know this. The step that puts you through the door into my office to study was the last one. The same way with God's plan. Baptism is not more important than hearing, believing, repenting, confessing. It's just the final place. The people who hear, the people who believe, the people who repent, the people who confess the name of Jesus are still in sin still outside of Jesus, still lost until they're baptized. But they are very important to get them to that point. You see, the world's most important question is this. If I die tonight, where will I be in eternity? You know what the answer to the world's most important question is? Here's the answer. You have to give it. I can't answer for you. You can't answer for me. But I can open up the Word of God and I can know this because this is what the Bible teaches. Anyone who has been immersed for the forgiveness of sins in order to be a child of God to complete the obedience that God requires, that person is in Christ. That person has a chance to go to heaven. That person is in a saved relationship with God. That doesn't mean they will always be saved no matter what they do. But that's not what we're talking about. That's a lesson for another time. Suffice it to say, what did it say? The end of God in this our guiltiness, the beginning of godliness. Here's what I know. There's not a person in this room right now who can leave saying, I don't know how to get into Jesus, because now you do. There's not a person in this room who can say, nobody ever told me. There's also not a Christian in this room who can say, it's so tough to get them to anybody that I know to understand that. It's not that tough. Just pick up the tract, hand it out, and let the power of the Word of God 
do the work. You just be available when they come asking questions. So today, if your life is not right and you know it based on what we've studied, or if you've left the godly life to go back to where you used to be, or if you just need brothers and sisters to pray on your behalf, we stand ready to aid you while we all stand and sing.